So we're continuing with Unit 7 on the industrialization and urbanization of America, most notably in the Northeast. And now today we want to talk about what was going on in the corrupted part of the Gilded Age. Mark Twain, probably one of America's most famous author, was uh, one of the few Americans self-aware enough to realize that we are living in a Gilded Age, meaning, yeah, it did seem like it was kind of nice on the outside, but underneath, there were definitely problems. So uh, we, in 7.2, we talked about the good part, the shiny part, the changes in technology and innovations, etc. cetera, uh, the growth of American industry. Now we're going to talk about the bad, the decayed. So some vocabulary to help you uh, understand some of the um, terms that we'll be using. Um, stalwart is a good word to recognize what we're doing here. Okay, moving on. So uh, in 7.2, we referred to people like, Rock, like of Rockefeller and Morgan, um, Vanderbilt, Dole, as captains of industry, as the people who were taking America to a, another level of an economic growth. Uh, but when looking at it through a different perspective, you might refer to them as robber barons. Baron is a noble's term, kind of like a lord or a, a duke. And so in America, anytime you refer to somebody with a term of nobility, there's always a little bit of you that's looking backwards at Europe in a negative fashion. If you remember the Hudson River School of Art uh, showed that the dead and decaying stumps and rocks in the forefront of all of their landscape paintings, that was meant to show that, that the old ways from Europe, including the nobility, were dead and dying. So uh, robber barons were basically people like Rockefeller uh, who had used a variety of techniques in this capitalistic industrial society to gain immeasurable wealth. Um, but people were starting to realize that it was coming at a cost. It was coming at a cost on the backs of workers, as you can see in this political cartoon, uh, in too much control over the government, as you can see in this cartoon. And so how did these robber barons gain such incredible wealth? Well, we also want to talk about some terms. Uh, a monopoly. When you have a monopoly, that means you own a large part, if not all, of an industry. You own all the pieces, therefore you can set the prices. People started to realize that there was some negatives to monopolies, so they started to legislate against them, which is when we hear the term trust start to be used. And when, in U.S. history, trust is bad. Um, and a trust basically is when a large robber baron, one of these tycoons, would take his company and put it in the trust of a corporation or board or a group of men. And they would basically do whatever he said, but then he could at least avow that, well, I don't own all of it. Uh, you know, this is a, a group effort sort of a thing. You could see the tentacles of the Standard Oil Company. That's what people thought of a trust. Now, there are two types of trust building. You have horizontal and vertical integration. In horizontal uh, integration, you purchase, own, control, all of one aspect of an economy. So for Rockefeller, he bought up all the oil refineries. And if you own all the oil refineries, you get to set the prices. And what he would do is he would basically, because he had such a large number of refineries, he could, in the short term, uh, lower a price and then go up to one of his competitors and say, well, you're going to have to lower your prices to keep up with me. And I know you can't because... If you lower your prices too much, you're going to lose too much money. I've got so many oil refineries, I won't lose as much. So why don't you just sell to me anyway? And he would kind of drive this competition um, into selling. Vertical integration is when you own one aspect of each parts of an industry. So you would own oil wells and oil refineries and trains to move the oil from place to place. Because in owning all of the different aspects, you can cut out having to pay the middleman in order for them to get a profit. And so if you can control um, an aspect, not all of it, but just a part of all of the pieces necessary, uh, you can cut your overall cost enough. So again, you could lower your prices and then start to drive out your competition. So in and of itself, those things aren't necessarily bad, but they were using those things, plus child labor, bribes, grafts, long hours, you know, crushing the workers, etc., uh, in order to become fabulously wealthy. 
Now, another one of the tools that uh, robber barons quote unquote used, and they didn't use this consciously, uh, but during this time, the, the belief of social Darwinism was pervasive. The idea that, you know, Darwin had said that the nature is controlled by survival of the fittest. And so some of these races and people are more fit. And because they're more fit, uh, that's why they have all these wealth. So John Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, they have nothing to fear or uh, nothing to be complaining about. We, we don't want to say bad things to these people because the reason they have so much uh, is they're the fittest. And so if you're poor, it's because you're not very fit. Um, and so they were able to kind of use this philosophy in order to basically, you know, appeal to the people and say, hey, you could rise to the top. There's nothing to prevent you from doing it. And whatever it takes to rise to the top is how nature works. And so that's how we're going to work. This interesting picture here on the right is uh, refers to something called phrenology. There was this uh, kind of interesting psychology that was going through some of the cities in which people were actually trying to typecast or stereotype criminals uh, by the size and shape of their head. And they felt like they could actually uh, point out to people who would be bad, you know, more likely to do bad events and crimes and stuff just by shaping their head, which is a very Darwinistic way of looking at people. So this was very pervasive in society. Uh, a good example of what this looked like, this um, corruption in government, is the idea of a political machine. So political machines are not necessarily new. They're, they're very common around the world. Um, but basically in America, political machines were when a large organization would kind of control usually city politics. Um, best example is Boss Tweed in Tammany Hall in New York City. So here's Boss Tweed in all these political cartoons. Uh, you can see how much bigger he is than everybody else, a little overweight, which shows the negative. This is him acting as Caesar, um, telling the Tammany Tiger to destroy Lady Liberty here. Notice he's inside the, the jail and out the other, too big for the police officer. Um, and in here, he's saying, well, if I count the ballots, then I know who's going to win. Um, these political machines were corrupt in that they would control politics through bribes, uh, through graft. You know, they would basically say, um, if if you give us the contract to, you know, build Madison Square or Times Square Garden, um, the Central, Central, Madison, Jeepers Creepers, Central Station in New York for the new subway, if you let us build this building, then we will give you some money back. So you give us the contract, we give you money, everybody gets rich. Well, that's illegal. Um, and they did some good things. You know, if you remember the culture shock we talked about for these Native American, new uh, immigrants coming to America, uh, the, you know, the political machines would show up, meet these people at the dock, help them find a place to live, get them a job, which was a good thing to do. But then they would turn around and say, now vote for whoever we, ever, we tell you to vote for. Um, there was a political cartoonist named Thomas Nast famous for the creation of Santa Claus, the version of Santa Claus that we recognize today from Samuel Clement Moore. Um, but he drew these political cartoons. And Tweed was famous for saying, well, none of my constituents can read, so I'm not worried about them, you know, reading editor editorials or articles in the paper to not like me. But they can all look at pictures. And every time this guy draws pictures of me, I look bad. And so Tweed was, in a way, taken down by... Um, these cartoons. So the government kind of protected these, uh, this big business, and it does it in two ways. Uh, first, you have these Republican stalwarts. A stalwart is basically somebody who says, yeah, we're all part of this um, Republican big business uh, web of corruption and graft, and that's the way it's going to be. Uh, we're going to stick to the old ways. We're going to keep the old ways. Half-breeds are Democrats who try and switch parties because they want to get part of the money bags that show up in the Senate. You could see all these, these representatives that were trust, the steel trust, the nail trust, the copper trust, standard oil trust. And they run the Senate of the monopolist by the monopolist for the monopolist. Um, and so the Democrats even came for the money. And then mugwumps 
is kind of a derogatory term. It's an Indian term that basically said, um, these are Republicans who are trying to get rid of this graft and this corruption. They're the ones who are ruining it for everybody else. So you have this group of Republicans mostly who are running the Senate, they're running politics, and they're you know very powerful in the government, and all these things help to combine to create a problem um, for Gilded Age politics. So at this point, I'm going to break uh, 7.3 into two parts. Uh, the second part will be the chart on the elections and campaigns during the Gilded Age.